We're talking now about uh, re Early Republic to Jacksonian, Part 2. I know in Part 1, in the lead-in slide, I said I was going to make one long uh, presentation instead of two kind of medium-sized one. But as it turns out, um, that did not work out. So I did divide it up into two, and uh, it's a little bit uncomfortable, but that's the way it goes. In part one, I did talk about Washington's administration. I talked about the political parties. I talked about Adams administration, and I got started on Jefferson with the first issue that he had to contend with, which was the Supreme Court. And that's Barber versus Madison, 1803. <clears throat> so in this presentation, moving forward, uh, we're gonna take a look at westward expansion. Uh, then we're gonna be done with the uh, um, Jefferson administration. I'll have a few things to talk about on that. And then uh, Madison, the War of 1812, then McCullough versus Maryland, and that'll be the end of Early Republic to Jacksonian. After that, it'll be Jacksonian, and I'll uh, have a slide on that at the very end of this presentation. So on your readings, no matter what text you have, um, this is key to the text that I happen to have when I made this slide, uh, but whatever text you have, just use your common sense, get to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago, 1848, and that will be kind of our bookmark for a, a midterm test. So with that in mind, let's get on with it. And we're continuing to talk about the Jefferson administration. So the Jefferson administration, now again, in the big picture, I pointed out that Jefferson's going to be Federalist to Anti-Federalist to Federalist. And so as we go through the rest of his administration, I want you guys to be looking for that Federalist tendency. Now, again, in Marvers Madison, you kind of saw a hint of that because Madison, who was supposed to be an anti-Federalist, used the power of his office to withhold those commissions. So right from the start, you start seeing um, this exhibition of power. Once, once they have power, they're going to use it. Well, another outstanding example of that, probably the best example, is the Louisiana Purchase 1803. So let's start with this really quickly. Now, Napoleon is going to make a deal. So for reasons we don't have time to get into, France controlled what will be called the Louisiana Territory. It had been Spanish this whole time. And then for reasons we don't have time to get into, France gets control of it, a part of it. Now, Napoleon had concluded that he wanted to occupy that area with troops. Uh, make it his own, get some troops down in New Orleans and have soldiers stationed in the Louisiana Territory. And we Americans definitely did not want that. We like, were really, really resistant to that idea, but there's nothing we could do. At the last minute, these soldiers are all loaded up in France. They're ready to go. There happens to be a short period of peace uh, in Europe. <clears throat> and uh, Napoleon decides to send these troops over. He's got 13,000 men. Cannons, equipment, tents, all the stuff that they need. But at the last second, there was a, a slave uprising. There was a rebellion on the French-controlled island of Haiti. Now, you all know how sensitive the French were to sugar production and the production of uh, raw materials coming from the Caribbean. So uh, Napoleon said, hey, I got all these guys loaded up. The ships were already sailed. The fleet's ready to go. So he said, go to Haiti. Uh, the island of Hispaniola, it was French control Haiti, and he said, go there and crush this rebellion, get rid of it. Then go on to, you know, New Orleans and control the Louisiana Territory. Well, the soldiers got there, and ladies and gentlemen, strong note here. He sent 13,000 men, and 90% of them died of disease within a very short period of time. Within like six weeks, that 13,000 turned into 1,300. Yellow fever, beriberi, mostly yellow fever, and scarlet fever, and all sorts of other um, terrible tropical diseases decimated the army, literally decimated it. So Napoleon said, listen, okay, I got it. I'd rather have the money for that area than to occupy with troops. If I want it, you know, I'll, I'll get it later on if I want to have it back. And so, he, now listen to me, strong note now. Napoleon said, I'll sell the Louisiana Territory to anybody who has the money except England. I won't sell it to the British. He had a lot of animosity toward the British, fine. 
Well, the only ones that were really interested in that area was, of course, the United States of America. So again, Thomas Jefferson, he's like, well, he had a big debate about this. And he said, I'm not sure I'm constitutionally authorized to do this. And he goes to Congress and says, well, what do you guys think? Should I do this? Should I not do this? And Congress simply exploded. And they were like, listen, you fool. We've got to get control of that area. We have to get control of it now, immediately. Don't be playing around with us, asking us if this is right or wrong. Get over there and make the deal and get an offer in. Otherwise, the Spanish will buy it back. The Dutch will get it. The Russians might get it. Somebody else might get it. Go get it right now. Go, 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 go. So sure enough, Thomas Jefferson, he acted in a very Federalist way. He went to the French and said, listen, we're going to give you all this money. The French said, okay, deal. Now, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to offer, the, the deal will be for $15 million for all of Louisiana. But like a big giant car payment or a house payment or something like that, we'll give him 3 or $4 million up front. As I recall, I think it was like $3 million up front, something like that. And then we'll pay the rest of it off. So I have up there a double asterisk. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, we're going to make this deal in 1803. We're going to pay some money up front, and we're going to start making payments on it. But then, in 1815, Napoleon is going to be defeated at the Battle of Waterloo, and he'll be out. And we'll get the royal government back in France. And so, immediately when Napoleon was out, we stopped making payments. And the French government said, hey, you guys, you, know, you guys have missed a few payments. You know you owe us money. And we said, once again... No, we made that deal with Napoleon Bonaparte. And if you'll bring back Napoleon Bonaparte, then we'll pay. But if you're not going to bring him back, then we're not going to pay. Again, that's the second time we'd pulled that stunt. We did that before at the end of the American War of Independence. When the royal government was out in 1789, we stopped making payments for all the money that we used in the American War of Independence. And now we did it again. Now, this is really, really slippery. And it makes it look bad on us. But I cannot overemphasize this. Our guys are doing what's right for our country. And you can pull a stunt like this. So the total payment, I think, was right around $7.5 million, $8 million. It was just over half the amount that we would promised. So we had no idea what we had bought. Uh, the next slide is a map. And uh, we won't spend much time on the map. I just want to show you what we bought. But it was vast, 800,000 square miles. So if you take the amount of money that we actually spent and divide it by 800,000 square miles, and for those of you guys who don't know, there are 360 acres in every square mile. So 360, how would it work out? 7.5 million, 7.5 million, divided by 800,000, divided again by 360. And that will give you about... Eight cents an acre. Eight cents an acre. That's about what we paid for this. And that is like, ah, cheap. So I guys made out on this deal. As you all know, it's been on, I've been talking about this our entire semester long. Land equals money. And man, did we make out on that deal. So we didn't know what was out there. Um, Thomas Jefferson is going to organize a the Corps of Discovery uh, it's known to history as the Lewis and Clark Expedition. Uh, his close personal friend is Meriwether Lewis. I have a picture of him in a, in a minute. And he was kind of the scientist guy, what they call back in those days a natural philosopher. And uh, he was to go out there, take a look at what's going on, figure out what it's all about. Uh, he was given an honorary rank of captain in the Army in case they ran into trouble. You know, he could like make out like he was an Army soldier. William Clark really was a captain in the army, and he's kind of, kind of be, you know, the brawn of this organization. He's going to go out there and, you know, do what needed to be done. Again, I mentioned this before. Uh, he is the oldest son of um, George Rogers Clark, who was the son of Robert Rogers of Rogers Rangers. So Robert Rogers Roger, Rogers Rangers, that's Seven Years' War. Then George Rogers Clark, American War of Independence, and now William Clark, Lewis and Clark Expedition. So again, a, a very important family in American history. Uh, 800,000 square miles, 3,700 mile round trip. My, several of my sources use that number. I have a doubt about that. I'm not too sure that it was actually that far. But that's what all my sources said, so I'm going to go with that. They go all the way out to the Pacific and they come back. 
12 tons of supplies. They did all sorts of really cool stuff and did not lose a single individual. About a day out from when they had departed, uh, one of the guys got a bad stomach ache, and uh, Meriwether Lewis determined that it was uh, appendicitis. And so they actually sent that guy back down to St. Louis, and uh, surprisingly enough, uh, he had an operation for his appendicitis and lived. And in 1803, I imagine that, that made the newspapers. So not a single casualty, not one. So it's a pretty amazing deal. So with all that background in mind, let's go to the next couple of slides and take a look at what uh, the Louisiana Purchase was really all about. All right, so that blue area right in the big fat metal of this map, that is the Louisiana Purchase. That is what we bought from Napoleon Bonaparte. And as you can see, I mean, just kind of imagine uh, folding that right where the Mississippi River, between that kind of green on the right and that blue in the middle, fold that in two, fold it over, and you'll see that that more than doubled the size of the United States. Uh, the promised price, the purchase price of 15 million, of which we paid, I don't know, seven or eight million of it. Not quite, not quite eight million. And so, uh, two, three, ten cents an acre, less than ten cents an acre, eight cents an acre, whatever it's going to be. So we we got we made out on that deal. So when we talk about the Louisiana Purchase again, think Federalist tendencies. Um, Thomas Jefferson's just going to get out the checkbook and write the check for this thing. Whether it was constitutional or not, he debated about that with himself, uh, with Congress, but they did it, and that makes it constitutional. So with that in mind, uh, we didn't spend long on this slide. I didn't want to. I just wanted to show you what we bought, and now let's go on to uh, the Lewis and Clark Expedition. So the Lewis and Clark Expedition, here we go. Meriwether Lewis, William Clark, there they are at the bottom. Uh, the guy that's kind of looking right at you, at the viewer, that's actually William Clark. Uh, the guy with the uh, that high collar sort of thing, that's Meriwether Lewis. And uh, those are the two guys who are going to be the leader of ex this expedition. They, um, <clears throat> on the map there, they left out of St. Louis. So again, they started off, obviously, in uh, Washington, D.C. and New York, Philadelphia. They started in Philadelphia, I'm pretty sure. But uh, they got their commissions in uh, Washington, D.C. and then had to get down to St. Louis. So they've already traveled you know, six or seven hundred miles and then put together the expedition at St. Louis. Then, understand what you're looking at, ladies and gentlemen. The flow of the river is from north to south. And so they've got to push up river. And you can see about two-thirds of the way up there, almost to the Canadian border, uh, they get to the Mandan villages. And they're having to, like, go against the stream. It's extremely difficult to do. They don't have a steamboat. They have to do it the hard way. They have to push it. The boat that they're on. So they get up to the Mandan villages and they pick up guides to go farther west. And this is a uh, French courier de bois. Yes, we, as late as 1803, 1804, we have courier de bois voyageurs out there in uh, that part of the world. And his name was uh, Charbonneau. C-H-A-R-B-O-N-N-E-A-U. Charbonneau, C-H-A-R-B-O-N-N-E-A-U. And Charbonneau, was, he was a trader. Uh, he worked with all the Native American tribes in that area. And he was going to be the guide for Lewis and Clark going on west. Now, hopefully you guys are sitting down where you're listening to this, because what I'm about to say is, like, incredible. When Lewis, who was the true leader of the expedition... <clears throat> when he got his commission from Jefferson, he and Jefferson were close personal friends. And Jefferson said, what we're really looking for is a water route to China. We're still looking to get to China after all of this time. But more importantly, you guys know, and I know, there's a gigantic geographic feature right there in the middle of the United States. There's no way there's going to be a water route through. And that's the Rocky Mountains. So what I'm driving at with this is that we had no idea 
that that geographic feature was out there. Obviously, the Native Americans who live there know it. I'll get to them in a minute. But we had no idea that the country had no idea what was out there in the West. None. Um, Lewis and Clark both talked about, you know, uh, they're moving into a country that no white man had ever seen. Well, yeah, that's probably true. Even the French Coureur de Bois had not gone out of that area. More about that in a minute. So they pick up Charbonneau. Now, his wife, as many of you know, is Sacagawea, S-A-C-A-J-A-W-E-A, -A -A -A. Sacagawea. Just look it up. Now, Sacagawea, uh, in our American mythology, we all want her to appear as this steely-eyed, courageous young woman who's, you know, kind of looking out to the horizon, saying, follow me and I will show you where to go. Well, that's, you know, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry, that's just not true. Uh, Sacagawea was 16 or 17 at the time, maybe 18 when this the whole thing was over with. And once they got away from the Mandan villages, she had no more idea where they were at or where they were going than anybody else. But what does emerge, mostly from William Clark, who wrote an extensive diary, it's all readily available, you can read it anytime you want. Mostly what, she, what emerges is she's a woman of tremendous common sense and resourcefulness. And that's about as good as it's going to get. I mean, you can't ask for more for some simply some 17, 18 year old girl who already has a child to take care of. And she's going to be very cheerful, very positive and very resourceful. Uh, one of the stories goes that they were pushing up river. And for whatever reason, Lewis and Clark were away from the boats. They pulled up on shore and one of the boats kind of tipped over. They lost some supplies. Well, Charbonneau was there. And um, evidently acted in kind of a stereotypical French way. He started hopping from foot to foot, you know, mon dieu. Uh, what do we do now? That sort of thing. And you could just imagine Sacagawea kind of rolling her eyes and says, okay, here's Charbonneau, here's the kid. And she jumped into the water and chased all the equipment downriver. It was floating downriver and threw it up on the beach. Then once she did all that, well, she got all the equipment, put it all together in one spot, and then we got some firewood, then unpacked the stuff, got a fire going, dried it all out. Just very common sense, very sensible. Another story, and again, we get this from Clark, and Clark would not dare make this up. It has to be true. So they got over towards the Rocky Mountains, and you can imagine they were a little bit disappointed about that. They had these big, gigantic mountains very very uh, uh terribly rough rugged mountains and they know they're not going to get the boats over it so then they have to have horses well ladies and gentlemen as you can imagine horses back in those days for native american culture were an extremely valuable asset extremely valuable so charbonneau says well we'll go talk to the shoshone and we'll see what we can do so Lewis and Clark and Charbonneau and Sacagawea and a couple other guys, they go talk to the Shoshone. And then they are, they have a big giant campfire going and they're talking to the Shoshone and they're trying to like exchange presents and make friends. And Charbonneau's talking to the Shoshone. Well, Clark talks about this. He's king on Charbonneau. And he's watching Charbonneau's body language and watching what he's saying. And he can make out that uh, things are not going well. The Shoshones are not happy. So Clark reaches down. There's only a couple of them, but the whole Shoshone nation right beside of him. And he's like, listen, I'm going to go down with a fight. And he gets his knife ready. He gets his guns ready. He's ready to fight it out. And again, he would not dare lie about this. It must have happened exactly the way he said, because everything else in this whole diary is true. At that point, just when they were like about to get like murdered and scalped by the Shoshone, Sacagawea jumps up, ran across to the chief of the Shoshone, threw her arms around the chief of the Shoshone and said, it's me, Sacagawea, your long lost little sister. Hey, I'm back. Oh, you're my older brother. Oh my God. And the chief of the Shoshone looked at her and turned her this way and turned her that way. And she said, you know what? You are Sacagawea, my long lost little sister. It turns out that the Nez Pierce years before had captured her from the Shoshone and sold her to the Mandans. And now here she is back again, and her brother was the chief of the Shoshones. And so, hallelujah, they got all the supplies and equipment and horses and guides and everything that they needed. 
again, it's 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 not you know Hollywood can't write this stuff. It's the craziest thing that ever happened. So they got over the mountains there. You can see on the map. Uh, they get onto the Columbia River. Um, and the Columbia River is a gigantic and powerful river. I've been to the Columbia River, and it is a, it's, it's not a joke. That's a river river. It's not like the Trinity River around Dallas-Fort Worth. This is a monster. And uh, so they got boats, and they, they built boats again, and they got everything back on, on track and floated down the uh, Columbia River to modern-day Astoria, Oregon. And they built a fort there. They were going to overwin over the winter. Uh, over winter there in their fort that they built, Fort Liberty or Fort Freedom, whatever it's called. The plan was that Jefferson was going to send a supply ship all the way around South America and then kind of hunt for them on that part of the coast, of the West Coast, and uh, try and give them supplies and pick up anything they needed to pick up and, you know, news and all that and the other. Well, of course, that was an excellent plan, but it never was going to work. The ship never did arrive. Another story on uh, Sacagawea kind of puts a, a human face on her. Uh, somebody came into the camp and said, hey, there's really something interesting down on the beach. There's the uh, uh, the bones of a big giant whale are down there. There's, you know, evidently a bone, uh, a whale washed up years ago, and the bones are still there. Well, this was, yes, very, very interesting. I'd like to see something like that. But anyway, Lewis and Clark... They got ready to like go down to the beach and take a look. And suddenly, uh, Sacagawea started throwing things around and kicking. And she was like, you know, just throwing a, a fit. And Clark went to her and said, what exactly is the problem? What, what's, what's the matter? And she says, here I am, and I'm doing all this stuff, and I'm working hard for you guys. And I want to go see, I want to go to the beach and see what's going on too. And so Clark said, well, come on, let's go. And so this kind of puts a human face on Sacagawea. Again, we went in our American mythology to make her out to be a big hero. Well, you know, if her hero is being an ordinary person, then she wins. One other story on uh, Sacagawea, not, not, so, um, not so pretty. But uh, Clark, again, he's, he's our main source on this. Clark, evidently, him and Sacagawea had kind of a, a father-daughter relationship. Uh, they, they, they seem to have bonded just a little bit in that kind of father-daughter way. But evidently, um, Charbonneau was, took to beating her. And uh, Clark put down in his diary that he had to pull Charbonneau aside. And he told Charbonneau, if you ever hit that little girl again, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to, I will kill you if you do that again. And so this sort of um, domestic abuse must have been pretty serious, not only for Clark to get personally involved in it, but for him to put it into his diary. So again, you know, I'm not talking about any kind of a love affair. There's nothing salacious going on here. But evidently, I'm, it's just indicative that Sacagawea is, is she's a, not, not worth making a myth over. She's an ordinary person in an extraordinary situation. Well, they stayed uh, near Astoria, Oregon, like I said, over the winter. Uh, they pulled down the camp and everything, went back up the Columbia River, dropped off their horses again, like they said they would with the Shoshone. Um, and they started heading back down river again to get to St. Louis. They dropped off Charbonneau and um, Sacagawea at the Mandan villages. Kind of an unfortunate um, end to that part of the story. A few years later, another traveler went through that area, and evidently smallpox wiped out all of the Mandan villages, killed everybody there. Uh, Mandans will emerge later on. A painter named George Catlin will uh, paint some of the Mandans, and that was in the late 19th century. But um, the chances are that Charbonneau and Sacagawea and the, the baby child we're all lost in a smallpox epidemic. Under any circumstance, they do not appear anywhere in history again. They're, they're lost to history. Lewis and Clark get to St. Louis. They pull their expedition to, uh, you know, they bring their expedition to a close. Uh, Clark will emerge later on as the first governor of the state of Missouri. And uh, he will stay there and be an active governor and continue to develop the area until he dies. Uh, Meriwether Lewis, again, a kind of a dark part of the story. 
I went back to Washington, D.C., uh, talked to Thomas Jefferson, gave up all the specimens. Uh, there were animals that they'd never seen before. The prairie dog, for example. Nobody had ever seen a prairie dog before. Nobody even heard of that. But he gave up all the specimens that he had, gave up all of his notes, um, was much celebrated. But he started suffering like very, very serious headaches, um, chronic headaches. And he recognized as a, you know, kind of a physician that it was almost certainly a brain tumor. And so um, he uh, eventually, the, the headaches got too bad for him and nothing was working. No opium, no alcohol was going to stop the pain. So I'm sorry to say he got a pistol out and uh, committed suicide. And back in those days, if you're going to use a gun, you know, you got to go through this big giant loading procedure. And if you're going to use a gun to, to do that terrible business, then you meant it. Anyway, that's the end of Meriwether Lewis. So with that in mind, uh, again, just think of that, that Federalist tendency. Uh, here we've got double the size of America. We sent people out there to figure out what was going on. And uh, we've got this tremendous um, area of land. So with that in mind, let's uh, go back to uh, the East Coast and let's talk about... Um, a growing a rift between us, once again, and Great Britain. We're heading now towards the War of 1812, and uh, this will be characterized by, really, um, the Chesapeake Affair. But uh, let me give you guys some background on this, and the bullet point there is the Napoleonic Wars. I told you guys all once before the Napoleonic Wars, we had to go over that kind of a, a bit, and that was going to be a backdrop to everything that's going on in America. That's, that's going to be happening. So this terrible series of wars really going from um, 1789 all the way to 1815. Uh, one war after another after another. There might be some little uh, periods of peace where they'll have a temporary treaty, uh, but it's almost never-ending warfare from 1789 with the French Revolution all the way to the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815. So the French are continuing to attack our ships at sea. And that's very troubling to Americans. And we don't know exactly what to do about it. Um, Adams has said, we've got to grow a big giant Navy. And again, listen for that Federalist tendency. As soon as he got into office, Thomas Jefferson said, yeah, we've got to grow a big giant Navy as well. And so here's something he was cursing Adams for. And three months later, he was like doing the same thing, raising taxes, selling a lot of money, and starting to pour that into a big giant navy. But more importantly in this particular case, strong note here, Great Britain had their backs against the wall. They absolutely had to control the French. They had to contain them, and they're going to fight incessantly, incessantly against Napoleon Bonaparte. One war after another, after another, after another. And these wars are going to follow right immediately, one after the other. And so drilling down from that a little bit, the only way Britain could really be, could be really effective in these conflicts is to control the sea. And for that, they had to have the Royal Navy. Now, there's a lot of books that have been written on this. Probably the best ones are... Um, the Command of the Seas by N.A.M. Rogers, and uh, he wrote a series of books on the Royal Navy of this period. Uh, Wooden Walls, Command of the Sea, uh, there's several of them. N.A.M. Rogers, he's your man on this. So Great Britain has their backs against the wall. They need to have men to man this gigantic fleet to contain the French. And sailors are the key here. Parliament will pass what's called Orders in Council. I have it written down up there. And the Orders in Council, strong note now, strong note. The Orders in Council say that any man born English who uses the sea may be impressed into the Royal Navy. Orders in Council. Any man born British who uses the sea, the ocean, is liable for impressment into the Royal Navy. Well, as good old Dr. Buchanan used to say, let's put some meat on them bones. 
So any man born British. Okay, so to England, to Great Britain, understand that everybody born in America before 1783, with the Treaty of Paris 1783, was born British. That's their, that's their law. So here we are, it's 1808, 1809, and those guys are in the prime of life. They're in their 20s, in mid-20s, early 30s. So they're prime material for you know being sailors, and they were born British. So using the sea, Orders and Council kind of said that, listen, if you do anything that's connected with the sea, then you're using the sea. So for example... If you're living in the Pennines, was right in the big fat middle of England, but you make a fishing pole, or you take a stick of wood and carve it into a paddle, or you know you take a little piece of wire and turn it into a fishing hook, then you use the sea. Now there are other restrictions on this, but in effect, everybody in England was using the sea, and so anybody was liable for this. But imagine if you're a sailor already and you're on a merchant ship, well you're certainly using the sea. You're on the sea. You're a sailor. So the last part of this, libel for impressment. I have the phrase up there, impressment. So impressment means literally they'll take a sort of a stick, a badge of office, and touch you with it, and you're in the Royal Navy. Just like that, bang. Now this is really, really unpopular in England. It's basically the, the enforcement, enforced um, pressing of men into the Navy. And being in the Royal Navy was very dangerous, as you can imagine. You got blown apart by a cannonball. Food was bad. Disease was even worse. But most people resented it because in a time of war, you could work as a sailor on a merchant ship and make a lot of money because it was risky. But if you got put into the Navy, then you didn't make much money. And so there's a lot of resistance to this. So here's what the Royal Navy starts doing. Strong note now. They'll wait around an American port or where American ships are known to like be headed as a destination, somewhere in Europe. And they'll sell up to an American ship and they'll say, listen, stop what you're doing. We're coming on board. And they do. British Navy ships board American merchant ships. And they say, you know, the British, the, the Royal Navy will say, well, you, 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 you and you. Yeah, you were born British, and so you're, now you're in the Royal Navy. Bam. Get on the boat, get your stuff, we're leaving. And you're never going to see your country again. That's it. You're in the Navy. And so this is just a form of, like, kind of legalized kidnapping, and it's only legal because Parliament said so. And so there's a lot of outrage in America about this. We don't like it. You can see that from that really well-drawn sort of painting up there in the upper left. Uh, we know allegiance to no crown, and there's the American sailor with the American flag, and there's uh, uh, Columbia, winged victory, right behind him. Uh, Isaac Cruikshank made this cartoon on the other side. We're going to try and resist this sort of thing, but there is, you know, the royal, the, the sailors, and they're coming up to the Americans and kicking them all around and throwing them into the sea. Uh, Cruikshank made sure that uh, the Americans are all wearing yellow pants as a, a sort of a, a signal that they, you know, urinated in their britches because they were so afraid. And there is, you know, Britannia triumphant, the, the English flag and everything, and they're just kicking these Americans around. Strong note here. Thomas Jefferson tried to react with an embargo. At the bottom left, you can see the Embargo Act of 1807, but and this had worked, as you all know, all the way back in the day, an embargo had worked. But this case, in this case, it backfires, and the ones who are hurt are American businessmen. We're the ones that are hurt. And so this really famous cartoon, which kind of says it all, and the one guy on the far side, kind of behind that turtle, says, damn, how it nicks him. And then the guy with the barrel says, oh, this curse is, oh, grab me. And oh, grab me is uh, embargo spelled backwards. And so everybody understood that the embargo was backfiring. It wasn't working. And so uh, that was a failure. 
Well, the next step then is called the Chesapeake Affair, 1807. Strong notes here. Ironically, and again, listen for that te Federalist tendency, ironically, where Adams was bitterly criticized for trying to join, to grow the Navy, Jefferson is going to, like, create more ships, more warships than, you know, Adams had ever done because he could see the war coming. Now, again, strong note here. The ships are the end product. When we talk about growing the Navy, I want you guys to be thinking of all of the um, the, the ship designers. You know, you can't just say, okay, I'm, I'm doing a merchant ship today, but tomorrow I'm going to do a warship. No, a warship is a special purpose design. Uh, a guy named uh, Humphreys, he was like um, one of the best designers. Uh, the USS Constitution, the USS United States, the USS Chesapeake, they're all Humphreys designs, and they are very, very good designs. So it's the designers, it's the guys that are going out into the forest and, you know, picking special trees that need to go into these ships. Uh, it's the guys that are doing all the, the work uh, in the shipyards. These are specialty shipyards. Ironically, many of the guns that we're going to get had actually been sold to the United States during the quasi-war to be used against the French. But then we solved our problems with the French, and now we're actually going to use these cannons made in Britain, for the most part, against the British. But obviously, when the war kicks off, our supply of cannons goes away. So we have to have the infrastructure necessary to make our own cannons. And so it's not the ships that I want you guys to be thinking about. That is the end product. It's all the infrastructure necessary to grow a Navy. Well, one of the ships that we're going to produce is the USS Chesapeake. Now, back in those days, the way you identified the size of a ship is by the number of guns. So it's Chesapeake 36. She had 36 guns, big giant cannons. The second thing you need to know about this is that, you know, when you get the ship all built and the Chesapeake was brand spanky new in 1807, you still have to man it with a crew, and then they have to go out on what's called a shakedown cruise. They still call it that today. And that's where you put the crew through all these drills, you train them all up, and they literally have to learn the ropes. That's where the phrase learn the ropes comes from. You have to know which rope in all the rigging does what task. And to do that, you have to train and train and train and train and train. And when you get done training, you train some more. We've talked about that. So the Chesapeake got her crew together. She got all built and completed. Uh, everybody talked about how she still smelled like, you know, pine and cedar and all these other oak and all these other woods. And she set to sail. And over the horizon came the HMS Leopard, 70. And the HMS Leopard sailed up and said, hey, we think you have British guys on board and we want them. Well, the captain of the Chesapeake said, listen, this is a United States Navy warship. And the people that are on board are United States Navy sailors, and we're not going to give them up. And the captain of the Leopard says, what, you're not going to give them up? Well, open fire. Again, our guys were not prepared for combat. They were not trained up. Whereas the Leopard had been at sea for like years and years and years, and their crew was highly trained. And so the Chesapeake was just blown to pieces. She didn't have enough guns to really respond. She was out of her class. So sure enough, the Captain Leopard sent a boat across, took four or five guys off of the Chesapeake, put them back in the Royal Navy. Our ship basically had to strike their colors. This is a symbol. You have to like pull your flag down. It's called striking your colors uh, as, a, a, as an admission of defeat. And the Leopard took these guys off and got on her ship and she sailed away. Well, again, strong note here, super strong note here. Immediately, Congress wanted a war. Congress wanted a war. Please write that down. We have the emergence of a political faction called the War Hawks. You'll never guess what they want. They want war, and they want it immediately. Continue on with strong notes. One of the leaders of this faction, the War Hawks, is going to be a guy named John C. Calhoun. And John C. Calhoun, later on, he'll be the vice president under Jackson, Later on, still, he'll be uh, arguing for um, uh, pro-slavery. He'll be arguing for secession. So he's important right up to the very eve of the Civil War. 
And he starts out as a dynamic young politician from South Carolina, and he is a war hawk. And they want war. They want war immediately. But Jefferson goes to them and says, listen, we're not ready for a war. Our army is like microscopic. Uh, the Navy is a joke. We have to continue on to build ships and to like build the Navy and build up the army and get, get ourselves ready for a war. And Jefferson continues to do that. So here's a man who wants a weak central government, but he's handed this situation and he has to like grow the Navy, grow the army. And that means growing taxation. And that means building all sorts of infrastructure, things that he would not ordinarily want to do with a strong central government. So once again, ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about uh, any one of these guys that like go in as an anti-federalist, the minute they get into office and any one of these presidents, they're going to go in as uh, states' rights and they're going to go in as a weak central government. But the minute they get elected, the minute they get in there, they need a strong central government. Yes? And so we're heading towards the War of 1812. Now, with that in mind, let's go on to uh, the Madison administration. So all of this was uh, handed off to James Madison, our next president, the fourth president of the United States. 1808 to 1816, he did get reelected. Madison got every electoral college vote but one. I've mentioned that before. Now, I'm a big admirer of James Madison. Uh, if you uh, take a, a book called The Federalist Papers, and I urge you all to read it, it is extremely difficult to read. It's um, targeting a highly educated political audience. But if you open up The Federalist Papers, I challenge you, if you open up The Federalist Paper to any page, any page, you will be reading the work of a genius. That's what it looks like to be a genius and write anything. But like many men who were uh, uh, tremendously intelligent, and he was highly, highly intelligent, he also had kind of a difficult personality. In other words, uh, he would have a conversation with you, and he was outgoing, I suppose, but he would talk to anybody, and if he evaluated you as being a, an, an idiot, he would say, well, you know, here's a ball. You go play in the corner. I'm going to go over and find somebody smart to talk to. So he could be kind of um, cold, he could be a little bit flinty, a little bit uh, hard to get along with, not really a, a, an outgoing, you know, warm, generous person. He just, you know, ah, because his brain was, uh, you know, kind of overpowered his personality. So when I have up there, week on foreign policy, uh, that's kind of what I'm driving at. Back in those days, diplomacy was done on a man-on-man -man basis. Uh, you talked to foreign ministers. Uh, foreign ministers would come to the United States, and they were on their best day. They were third-rate because America was seen as the struggling third-rate, fourth-rate country. But Madison would go talk to these ambassadors from England, from France, from throughout Europe, and he would evaluate them and say, listen, you're, you're, you're of low intelligence. And he would go talk to somebody else. He'd go talk to the smart people. Well, foreign ministers from other countries don't do well with that sort of thing. And so they would write letters back to their home country, whether it's Great Britain or uh, the Dutch or the French or whoever it was, and it would all be very negative towards Madison. And it's not because Madison was a bad man. He was just talking to morons. And that's not a matter of fault. It's just a matter of fact. So that does not aid him as we're heading towards the War of 1812. More about that in a minute. Now, a strong note here, because this is a matter of tremendous debate, and I talked about this when we talked about our political slide. I said you were going to need it, now you do. Now, Madison, as you all know, has written the Constitution. He wrote it. That's his handwriting. He took a lot of stuff out of the Arts of Confederation. He consulted with other people, but that Constitution, he wrote it. He's a genius. The Federalist Papers, which I just mentioned, that is how you read the Constitution. In other words, you can read the Constitution anytime you want. It's right there in the textbook. But how you interpret it, how you understand the debate and the argument behind it, that's the Federalist Papers. And Madison wrote down every sentence that is in the Constitution, was debated, and it's all in the Federalist Papers, and it's an amazing document. Adams had formed the first national bank. Please write that down. 
With all that in mind, with Madison, the Federalist Papers, and the Constitution, Adams had formed the first national bank. He had commissioned it, and he commissioned it, but he gave the commission a limited lifespan. So it's only good for X amount of years. So that passed over the Jefferson administration and landed in the Madison administration. And Madison, who is, he understands the Constitution, took a long, hard look at recommissioning the bank and said, no, that is not one of my powers. So the First National Bank went away. And again, what I want you guys to get out of this is this is a matter of tremendous political debate. And we will, uh, we're not done with that debate. But that is the background. Please put a star next to this in your notes. Color it all in. You're going to need this later when we start talking about uh, McCullough versus Maryland. This will be an important part of that court case. So toward the War of 1812, uh, he gets into office. He keeps telling Congress, you're not going to get your war. You're not going to get your war. You're not going to get your war. However, the British keep grabbing our guys. The French start grabbing our guys. Everybody's like seeing the United States as a weak power that cannot protect their own merchant people. And so they can like grab our ships and grab our guys. And this begins to negatively impact our overall economy. And so Congress says, we've got to have a war, we've got to have a war, we've got to have a war. And Madison keeps saying, no, 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 no. We have to grow the Navy and we have to grow the Army. And I'm sorry to say he does a bad job at both. He does get reelected, but on June 11th, 1812, strong note here, Congress went to him and said, we're going to have the War of 18, we're going to have this war. And so, since Madison knows the Constitution, when Congress basically forces him to declare a war, then he has to do that. That's the Constitution. It's not the president that declares the war, Congress does. We had to go along with it. So we're going to go ahead and talk about the War of 1812 in the next slide, and then we'll go on to the slide after that and talk about the Indian Wars in the Old Northwest. Uh, later on, we'll get down there in a little ways, and we'll talk about interrelated topic. Uh, we'll talk about slavery a little bit. All right? So let's move forward. So the War of 1812, Congress forces the president. Now, for those of you guys who are doing um, essay response papers, one of them in there talks about Madison and the War of 1812. And the thesis statement on that essay, and I urge you all to read it because it's an amazing essay, is that the underlying cause of the war and the people who are responsible for it is confusing. And the reason why it's confusing is that people at the time were confused. So let's try to unpack this just a little bit. Congress is going to force the war onto Madison. And that means that the states had to agree with the war. Strong note now. Now, what, what, what the Northeast wants is they want, to try and grab, they want to try and grab Canada. Now, I've mentioned this before. Let me mention it again. We're going to try and grab Canada on four separate occasions. And I don't know why. I have no idea why we want to grab Canada. We do not need snow or trees or a bunch of angry, you know, French expatriates. We didn't need Canada. But the Northeast wants to try and grab it. That, that's what they want. For the South, the underlying cause of the war is the Warhawks. John C. Calhoun of Virginia, North and South Carolina, Georgia. They feel that their honor has been insulted. And so they want a war on principle. That Britain can't kick us around. Okay, well, fair enough. Not, not a bad motive, but they were like screaming their heads off, demanding a war, and not doing a thing to actually prepare for it, which are two separate items. So Madison finally caves in. He says, okay, we'll have this war. Continue on with strong notes here. Fast forward to the Treaty of Ghent, which is going to be in 18, uh, 1815. Okay, so the Treaty of Ghent, uh, we're going to sign this thing, and I'm telling you right now, we did not win the War of 1812. We did not. So immediately, Congress, both the House, the House of both the um, House of Representatives and the Senate, they all blame Madison. And Madison says, "Well, you sorry outfits, you made me do this thing." So because we did not have a victorious war, and we did not, everybody starts pointing fingers at the other guy. And Madison says, "Well, I didn't want the war, 
And what does Congress say? Well, we didn't want the war either. Ugh. Nobody wants to accept responsibility for this thing. And so, if you're do again, if you're doing an essay paper, uh, essay response paper, and you see that essay, you choose to do it. Uh, it seems confusing in the way the author uh, approached the essay. That's because people were confused at the time for the reason I just articulated. But in an overview, because we're out of time and we don't have time to go through the entire War of 1812, like bit by bit, the Army does poorly. Uh, believe it or not, here we are in the War of 1812, 1814, 1813, 1814. And um, Congress is having to reach all the way back to the American War of Independence, which ended in 1783, and try to come up with some generals. And these guys were in their 70s and 80s. And we're trying to use them as generals. General Washington has said repeatedly and at length that he needed a professional European-style army to be able to fight with. And we did, and he was right. And I've talked about that. But in the immediate aftermath of the American War of Independence, we said, no, American mythology demands the, the Minuteman. The, the guys were out there in the fields. They were plowing their fields. And they had their musket shot and powder right there with them. And then the bell rang. You know, the whistles blew. The drums beat. And then our guys, like, showed up and then beat the crap out of the enemy. That is not what happened. But that, um, that myth is very, very cheap. A trained, armed, European-style army is expensive. So Congress and the various presidents said, yeah, the Minuteman, that's what did it. Because it was cheap. It was inexpensive. Well, now we have a full-blown war on our hands, and we have, like, no army. So the local militias were all called up, and they didn't know what they were doing. These Minutemen, they had no idea. So the army does poorly. We get beat again and again and again. Let me draw your attention to the map up there in the upper right. You see all those explosions up and down the uh, the border of the Great Lakes region, the border between Canada and America. And there's all those explosions. And we get beat again and again and again. Most famously, uh, the British are going to send a, um, a fleet to go into the Chesapeake and attack Baltimore which is an extremely important city in America at the time, and then go to Washington, D.C. And again, the Army can't hold those guys back. They get beat again and again and again. Ironically, strong note here, the problem, the underlying cause of the war was these orders in council, which allowed British ships to go out there and impress our guys. Well, just a couple of days before the war started, Parliament rescinded the orders in council. So the underlying cause of the war was solved, and then the war started. But once we were in it, you know, Britain said, oh, okay, well, we'll just beat the crap out of you. You know, our guys didn't want to back out. And they wanted to grab Canada. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, we were in no shape, fashion, or form ever going to beat Britain at this time in American history. Never. Never. So this was a huge gamble that was not going to pay off. However, the Navy does really well. The Navy does do good. Uh, our ships on the high seas, when they get into a one-on-one -on -one fight with British ships, we win. Uh, the USS Constitution took the Guerrier. Uh, the USS United States took Java. Uh, the Hornet took a fly. Uh, they were outclassed. The Enterprise took a half a dozen ships down the Caribbean. And so our ships are either equally matched or they are actually outclassed by the enemy, and we beat them. And so our Navy actually does really, really well in this, in this conflict. It really paid off to pour a lot of money and time and effort into our Navy. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, the USS Constitution, which was launched in 1797, uh, that ship still floats. I don't mean a copy of it. I mean the actual ship. So the, United, the people of the United States of America got their money's worth out of that. Uh, the Essex did really well. The Chesapeake did get captured by the British. Um, but our, overall, our guys did really, really well. They fought hard. Now, the British will attack Washington, D.C. Again, you see up there on the map where it says 1814 and that arrow going in, that's uh, the British attacking Washington, D.C. And I just want to have just a bit of an aside here and talk about Dolly Madison. Now, in terms of her personality, Dolly Madison is exactly the opposite of her husband, James Madison. And Dolly Madison is our true first true first lady 
In other words, it wasn't Martha Washington. She stayed at Mount Vernon. And there wasn't any idea of having a first lady under any circumstances. It wasn't Abigail Adams. She stayed in Massachusetts while John Adams did his thing. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's wife had passed away by that time. He had a daughter. I think Rachel was her name. And he had a very strange relationship with her. So she's not going to emerge as any kind of a, a first lady at all. He wouldn't have it. But uh, Dolly Madison is the husband of James Madison, and she's our true first first lady. Where James Madison can be hard to get along with and a little bit brittle and a little bit of a, you know, kind of a bad personality, Dolly Madison was always outgoing and forthcoming and very warm and generous, and she was really, uh, by all accounts, really super smart, but also a very generous and, and, and warm uh, person, very, very friendly. So when James Madison would make some kind of like diplomatic error, uh, Dolly Madison would like come along afterwards and she would straighten it all out. She would get it all fixed up. She like, you know, smoothed everything down. She was very, very good. She's underrated as a part of American history, badly underrated, which is unfortunate. Now, Dolly Madison and James Madison had a genuine love affair relationship. It wasn't a marriage of convenience. It wasn't an arranged thing. They actually had a tremendous like, very, very much of, of a love affair relationship. But the British landed. They just pushed the army out of the way. Uh, the story goes that uh, James Madison, he had to go out there. This is his finest moment. Uh, we've only ever had two presidents in American history that as president were within the sounds of the guns. We've had several presidents who were military men. Um, Washington himself, uh, Jackson, um, Grant later on, uh, Truman, these were military men. But we've only had two presidents, Madison and Lincoln, who as president were within the sound of the guns. And this was Madison's best moment. Um, the soldiers were on the way, the British were on their way. Madison got on a horse, went charging out across the countryside. Uh, he would find units of the army, he would like try to encourage them. Uh, he would go talk to the generals and try to encourage them. You know, what do you need? How can we work this out? Uh, famously went riding up to this group of soldiers and said, pull yourself together. Think of your country. Be patriotic. And somebody said, who the heck are you? And he had to self-identify as the president of the United States. So, uh, you know, there was James Madison. Again, his finest hour. Back in the White House, Dolly Madison and James Madison, they were the first true occupants of the White House, the, the, the executive mansion, they called it then. Uh, she told all the servants, listen, get a warm meal ready to go, have it all set up. Because at any moment, the president and the generals are going to come in and they're going to be hungry. So get everything set up. And the servant said, okay, we will do that. Well, about that time, uh, somebody came in the front door and said, hey, the British are marching down the street. They're on their way in. There's nothing going to stop them. And Dolly St. Madison, God bless her, she kept her head. She absolutely reacted uh, with a strong will. And she said, listen, get a wagon pulled around to the back of the, of the executive mansion in the White House. And she, instead of saving any personal items, she said, listen, we're going to save all the items that are important to the nation. She saved our original copies of the Declaration of Independence, the original copies of the Constitution, all of our diplomatic notes, that big giant painting of George Washington that you saw on one of those earlier slides. She saved that. That's what she saved. Put all that stuff in the wagon. Then literally, she stepped out the back door of the White House, and British troops kicked in the front door. All the servants ran off. The story goes that um, the British officers came in. Here was all this food laid on the table. They sat down and had this big, giant feast. Uh, got good and drunk. They drank all the alcohol. Uh, they had a mock session of Congress. They said, hey, we vote that, you know, Americans are all rogues and idiots, and that the war is over, and blah, blah, blah. Then they smashed the whole place up, and on their way out the door, they threw, out a lit tor uh, they threw in a lit torch and started burning the White House. Uh, there are burn marks in the White House to this very day. Well, the soldiers, you know, they did all the damage that they could, and they marched out. Uh, a little bit of a sidebar here, uh, two sidebars as it turns out. Uh, number one, uh, the story goes that uh, the fire was burning, and the soldiers had marched out. Well, a big giant storm came along, and this is true, the rain put the fire out and saved most of the building. 
It wasn't completely destroyed. But evidently that same storm that put the fire out also spawned a tornado. And the tornado came down and hit the British camp. The tornado killed more British soldiers than the army did. I always kind of make a joint, a little bit of a joke. Uh, whose side is God on? Well, there you go. Another sidebar is that uh, a couple of days later, and it must have been one of those moments that you would really like to have seen in eye to eye uh, in person, uh, Dolly Madison and President Madison met. And both of them had been completely uncertain what had happened to the other. Uh, but they met, and you can imagine James Madison all spattered with mud and exhausted. And there's Dolly Madison all, you know, m you know, worried and uh, not knowing what's going on. And uh, they finally, you know, met, and everything was okay. So uh, the last part then, uh, the Battle of New Orleans. Very quickly on this. Uh, the British were very uh, kind of arrogant about this. And they wanted to capture... New Orleans as a bargaining chip at the negotiating tables. Please write that down. The British wanted to capture New Orleans as a bargaining chip at the negotiating tables. So they published that in the newspapers. And so our side knew it. Uh, Madison uh, sent a message out to Nashville, Tennessee. It's on the map there. And said to a little-known colonel of infantry, militia, named Andrew Jackson... Go down to New Orleans, get everything pulled together, and set up the defense. Gather all the men you can. Uh, Jackson uh, gathered up men on the way, uh, beat them into shape, trained them and trained them, uh, threatened them with you know execution if they tried to mutiny, and got down to New Orleans. He found out there was no preparations for a battle at all. He made a deal with some rogues and pirates, especially a guy named Jean Lafitte. I said, listen, help us fight the British. And they were all French. And they said, okay, we hate the British. And so to make a long story short, in December 1814, December 1814, as it turns out, Christmas Day, December 25th, 1814, the Battle of New Orleans took place. Uh, the British showed up. It was really their A team. Uh, they had their best guys there. Uh, their best general was a uh, general named Wellington. He was not there, but his second in command, a general named Packenham, was. And Packenham knew his business. Uh, bear in mind that these soldiers and generals had been locking horns with Napoleon Bonaparte for the previous 10 years. So these were the A team. They were the best guys. Well, the fight lasted uh, less than 30 minutes. We had 13 U.S. casualties and 3,000 British casualties. I will say that again. The battle lasted under half an hour. The United States had just a few, 13 casualties, and the British had nearly 3,000 casualties. So this was a tremendous victory on our side. The problem was, okay, I got my dates mixed up, so scratch out your dates. The battle was in the middle of January 1815. January 1815, that was the battle. The problem was that on December 25th, 1814, that's the date that I meant to say, we signed the Treaty of Ghent. December 25th, 1814, we signed the Treaty of Ghent. But the Battle of New Orleans was in January 1815. News of the Battle of New Orleans, I'm sorry, news of the treaty had not got to New Orleans before they fought the battle. So the Battle of New Orleans was fought after there was a peace treaty. Now, nobody's to blame on this because that sort of thing happened from time to time. What's important about the Battle of New Orleans? Andrew Jackson was a nobody before that fight. But after that fight, he was a public figure because he's the only victorious general that we had during the entire war. He's the only one that had a meaningful victory. And ironically, his victory was in January 1815, and that was after the war was over with. So Andrew Jackson became a very important person in American history after the Battle of New Orleans, because of the Battle of New Orleans. But it was fought after the war was over with. 
So again, with that in mind, uh, the War of 1812, uh, it wraps up. It's over with. Treaty of Ghent, there you go. And uh, we were beaten. Strong note here. There is a positive side to this. Because the British beat us, and they knew it, we got beaten. We didn't acknowledge that, but we got beaten. We did. But because Britain beat us, then, strong note now, then they could be friendly towards the United States. All that problem with them being childish and, and, and petty that has stemmed from their loss of the American War of Independence. Suddenly, all that pettiness, all that childishness, all that's gone. Because why? They beat us. We didn't grab a bit of Canada. They're not really interested in uh, the Battle of New Orleans because that was after the war was over with. The Royal Navy was still number one. And so, but having beat us, then they could be friendly towards us. And so throughout the rest of the 19th century, we'll have a very, very positive relationship with Great Britain. And in many ways, that lasts to this very day. And so that's the, that's the real diplomatic outcome of the War of 1812. Britain beat us. They did. And so diplomatically, that can be very, very positive towards us. All right, well, that's all I have to say on this. Let's go to uh, Native American Affairs, which will be the next slide. We haven't talked about Native American Affairs in a while, but this is a big deal. All right. We're talking now about Native American Affairs. And um, again, I want you guys to go back in your notes if you need to, but please bear in mind that that, that pattern that emerges about Native American affairs. Uh, if you need to look at your notes, look at your notes, but as a reminder, it's encroachment, then Native American reaction, then a war breaks out and the Native Americans are initially successful. Then the Americans come back. In this case, the Americans come back with teamwork and technology and they beat the Native Americans and wipe them all out and then grab the land. And then the cycle starts over again. So let's see if that works in this particular case. The Americans were claiming the Ohio River Valley and they were claiming the Louisiana Territory. They were claiming that. And Americans were starting to move into the Ohio River Valley. Well, that's the encroachment. Now, here comes the Native American reaction. And that leads us to talk about this man, a man, the leader of the Shawnee Nation, and his name is Tecumseh. Uh, sometimes you'll hear it pronounced Tecumseh, but it's Tecumseh. Now, the Native American reaction then, Tecumseh, is going to approach the British. And he's going to say to the British, hey, listen, let's team up. So the events that we're talking about here happen during, as an element of, the War of 1812. The Native Americans are going to react by talking to the British. Then a war breaks out, and they're initially successful. So... Uh, if you need to go back to that previous map, the one that's uh, right there on the same slide with Dolly Madison, all those explosions up and around the Great Lakes region, those are successful battles because of Tecumseh and the Native Americans. They really stepped up. They went out there to help the British, and they did a really good job helping the British. And so the Americans couldn't do anything without the Native Americans scouting on them and then blowing the crap out of them. So, again, our pattern... It's not a pattern that I made up and then try to force events into it. It's the other way around. Here are these events, and they form a pattern. Encroachment, Native American reaction. They're going to go talk to the British. You see Takem say there in that painting, and he's wearing uh, the coat of a British officer. He, symbolically, he was a general in the British Army. And so that gives you an indication of how close this relationship was between the Shawnee Nation in this case and the, Native, and, and the British. Well, the war breaks out, the War of 1812, the Native Americans are initially successful. So, with that, let's go to this uh, list of bullet points that you see there in the middle of the slide. Take him say's rebellion. Take him say had a goal. He wanted to make a pan-Native American league. That's what he called it. That's what everybody called it. And he kept saying, we have to team up. The Americans are the real enemy here. You have to forgive all the dogs barking in the background. The Native Americans understand that the Americans are the real enemy here. And the only way they're going to beat the Americans is to team up. So take him, say, he says, we've got to go to all these different tribes. And he does go to all these tribes. And he says, we've got to bury, our, bury the hatchet. 
We've got to end our differences. We can't keep fighting among ourselves. Aided by the British, he does get aided by the British. They give him all sorts of trade goods, musket shot, powder. They give him everything that they can to like form this Native American League. And that will be basically the Ohio River Valley. Spiritually led by the prophet. Uh, usually, I would go to the next slide, and I'd have a big slide on uh, his brother, the prophet. But I, you know, in the, in the interest of time, uh, we're not going to do that. The prophet was Tecumseh's brother, Tenskwatawa. Now, very briefly, Tenskwatawa was a spiritual leader. So we're just going to go by his, uh, his nickname there, the prophet. So the prophet, take him say his half-brother, same father, different mother. Uh, he was, uh, in his early life, he was seen as a, a useless individual. Um, he was clumsy. He was not a good hunter. He was not very physically fit. Um, somehow he managed to, this is true, put his eye out with a bow and arrow. I don't even know how you do that, but he did it. Uh, he became an alcoholic. He did get married, but his wife was always beating him up and saying, go out and find some food. And he'd come back with, you know, a rabbit or a duck or something like that. He was a lousy hunter, and he was lazy, and he was just like very, very poorly thought of. But evidently, the story goes, he was in a, a drunken stupor and fell into the fire. He was so drunk, he passed out and went into the fire. And everybody thought he was dead. So eventually, they got around to pulling him out of the fire. But instead, he had a dream experience, which among the Native Americans is like a really, really big deal. And in this dream experience, he comes out of it, strong note here, and he says, okay, we have to go back to our Native ways. We have to go back to our ways. We have to shun the white man. We have to get rid of this idea that we need these trade goods. We have to go back to the old ways. If you're going to go hunting, use a bow and arrow. If you need clothing, you know, go shoot some animal and turn the skin into clothing. We don't need that stuff. And in broad measure, that's probably true. The Native Americans could always subsist fine on their own resources. All these trade goods they're getting from the Europeans are luxury items. Furthermore, and this is a very strong note that I want you to write, and you're going to need it later. And every time I tell you you're going to need it later, you always do. They also basically passed a law among all the Native Americans that you can, may no longer sell or give land to the white man. And the penalty for that is death. Now, I've mentioned this before. There was no death penalty among the Native Americans. I talked about this a long time ago. Instead, they would cover up a crime with presents. There's no death penalty among the Native Americans. I said you were going to need that. Now you do. Because it would start a blood feud. But now, things are so desperate that they have to have a death penalty. Well, it turns out, as the story goes, Tecumseh is down talking to the Cherokee, which is all the way down in Tennessee and Georgia. And he's trying to tell them, the Cherokee, you know, we need to team up. We've got to have this pan Native American League. And again, in our cycle of conflict with the Native Americans, this is where uh, the Americans come back with teamwork and technology. William Henry Harrison found out that Tecumseh, the big military leader, was gone. And so he launched an attack. And this is at the Battle of Tippecanoe. You can see it spelled down there, T-I-P-P-E-C-A-N-O-E. -E. William Henry Harrison is going to attack the Native Americans at the Battle of Tippecanoe. And Tecumseh was in charge. I'm sorry, Tecumseh was in charge, but he was away. And so the prophet happened to be there that day, and he was defeated. Now, as for the battle itself, all I have to say is this. There's a lot of confusion about it. William Henry Harrison, who will later on be the president, he's going to make a big deal out of it. But when you take a look at the post-combat reports, there's only a few people killed. So William Henry Harrison is saying this is a gigantic, huge battle. And evidently it wasn't, all right? So a lot of confusion about the battle itself. But what's important here, you guys, is that the spiritual leader, the prophet, was defeated in a battle. And among the Native Americans, that's very symbolic. It means that the great spirit may not be on their side after all. 
uh, if their religious leader is, is defeated in a battle, that's like a really, really negative thing for the Native Americans. Furthermore, the British want peace, and so they stop supplying the Native Americans. They stop giving them musket shot and powder. Tecumseh comes back. He pulls the situation together, re-energizes everyone, but he too is killed later on at the Battle of the Thames. So, let me wrap this up. There's a reason why we have not talked about Native American affairs in a while. If you look at your notes, we haven't talked about Native American affairs in a long time, seven years war, really. And so let's go back very, very briefly on this, and let me talk about that. And then we have a court case, and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up Jacksonian America. The reason why we have not talked about Native American affairs is actually quite simple. In 1763, at the end of the Seven Years' War, the French are out. And so the Native Americans approach the British and say, okay, well, we can't depend on the French anymore. Let's make, let's make friends with the British. And to symbolize this new friendship, the Native Americans tell the British, you've got to give us presents. You've got to give us stuff. Well, in 1763, there's this gigantic debt load. So Jeffrey Amherst tells the Native Americans, listen, we're the only game in town, you fools. We're not going to give you anything. And that started a war among the Native Americans. I've talked about this. You're either at peace or you're at war. The Native Americans had approached the British and said, let's be friends, give us presents to like symbolize our friendship. It didn't have to be much. We have to symbolize our friendship. Jeffrey Amherst said no, and that meant to the Native Americans, well, we're at war then, you fool. All right. So this is sometimes referred to as Pontiac's Rebellion. Pontiac was only involved in it at the very last moment of the war and not heavily involved even then. But it rolls off the English tongue really well, so we call it Pontiac's Rebellion. Under any circumstances, London tells Amherst, listen, you, you fool, you got us into another war. What's the matter with you? We're trying to stay out of a war. End it fast. I hope you guys are all sitting down for this because what I'm about to say is horrible. Jeffrey Amherst said, okay, I'll end this war really quickly. And we know what happened next is true because he wrote a letter identifying what they needed to do. He said to all of his military officers, go out and get blankets to trade to the Native Americans as a trade good. But make sure you get blankets from sick people. Get blankets from people who have smallpox or some other communicable disease. If they got the flu, get their blankets. Give it to the Native Americans. Well, obviously the Native Americans have no idea about this. And so what's the reason why we haven't talked about Native Americans in a while? An epidemic spreads and wipes them out. Richard White, in his book, uh, Settling with the Indians, he talks about this extensively. But here we are in Tecumseh's Rebellion, 1811, 1813, and the Native Americans have come back. In other words, they suffered this pandemic in which, God knows, hundreds of thousands died. And it was deliberately spread by Jeffrey Amherst. It was deliberately done. But finally, the Native Americans have come back. Uh, the Iroquois are almost entirely wiped out. The Mohawks and all those other guys, they're, they're done for. But this is the Shawnee Nation. They were kind of spared from a lot of that. But they've come back, and now they're ready to fight again. So that's why we hadn't talked about Native American affairs for a while. However, uh, to end this, uh, William Henry Harrison is going to beat the Native Americans at Tip Canoe, and then later on the Battle of the Thames. And uh, when we talk about Native American removal later on, uh, the, um, the real result of this is that the military strength of the Native Americans is wiped out. And so they'll be ejected just a few years after all these events. So with that in mind, let's talk about one more court case, and then uh, we'll transition and switch to Jacksonian America. Now, our court case here is McCullough versus Maryland, 1819. So once again, like always, I'll give you the background, both sides of the case, the outcome of the case, and what it means to American history. So the background, background very briefly. Now, this is a, this is a very complex case. And so what I'm giving you here is a thumbnail sketch of it, and it's very, very deceptively, I'm not trying to deceive you, but it's deceptively simple. There's a lot going on here. 
But let's start with the background. Madison had killed the First National Bank. That's why I covered it. Madison got rid of it. When it came up to be rechartered, he said, I'm not going to recharter the bank because he didn't think it was constitutional. But then he fought the War of 1812. And he concluded that a U.S. national bank is, in fact, a handy device to control the economy, to borrow money from, to, like, you know, have as a presidential tool to aid in emergencies. And so he recharted the bank, and uh, it's going to be the second U.S. bank. Now, we know it's, it's the U.S. bank because the biggest single depositor was the people of the United States of America. They deposited $3.2 million in gold into the bank. And that made the people of the United States of America, working through the president and working through Congress, the biggest stakeholder, the biggest shareholder in the bank. $3.2 million in gold deposited into that bank. And that made it very, very, very stable. Please write that down. Madison's going to recharter the bank. He took another look at the Constitution, which he wrote, and then concluded we could have a bank after all. He rechartered it. <laughs> Again, it does have a, um, a drop-dead date on it, but that'll be you know 25 years on down the road. We'll run into that again later on under Jackson. And the bank itself is run in a very conservative way. In other words, you're only going to loan money to people who don't need it. Now, this put the U.S. bank, strong note now, into competition with state and local banks. There'll be branches of the U.S. bank in New York, Baltimore, all the major cities. And this made the U.S. National Bank, the U.S. Federal Bank, a competitor to state and local banks. So here are all these other banks, state and local, state and local banks, which are really speculative. And they crash all the time. Now, think, think, think. If you're one of the big money boys, you want your money to be safe. And so you tend to deposit your money into the U.S. bank. And state and local banks did not want that. They want big money boys to deposit in their banks to aid them. So... The big money guys in Maryland, strong note now, we're zooming in. The big money boys in Maryland went to the Maryland government, state government, and said, listen, we want you to find a mechanism to destroy the U.S. bank. Get it out of Baltimore. Okay. Well, that's what those guys did. And they came up with a Stamp Act style tax. The law basically said, this is from the state of Maryland, that any bank issuing money wherein the bank is not commissioned by the state of Maryland must have a stamp and a tax on their documents, on their money, the money that they issue, the bank notes that they issue. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the only bank not commissioned by Maryland was the U.S. Bank. So the U.S. Bank was going to have to pay a tax, a Stamp Act style tax on the money that they issued, on the dollars that they issued. Well, this went on for a while, and then Maryland came to the bank manager, James W. McCullough, and said, here's the bill, you got to pay so that then is the two sides of the case. Maryland has taxed the U.S. bank, and they want their money. James W. McCullough happens to be the bank branch manager. Back in those days, they called him a cashier. Uh, back in those days, the guy that's behind the, the, the cage giving you your money back and forth, uh, that was called a teller back in those days. And the cashier was the bank branch manager, and that's James W. McCullough. And McCullough looked at the, the officials from Maryland and said, I'm not going to pay. No way. You can't do that. Well, as you all know, any dispute between the state and federal government goes straight to the Supreme Court, which is what happened here. 
So Maryland's case is the Tenth Amendment. And they say all those uh, issues not given to the federal government and the Constitution are uh, given over to the people or the states respectively. And that's the Tenth Amendment. And they're saying that, listen, uh, we don't think that this bank is constitutional in the first place. And so we can tax it. The federal government side, that is, say, James W. McCullough. Sidebar, McCullough actually fought his own case in the Supreme Court. He didn't get a lawyer. He just went up there himself, which is pretty bold for a Supreme Court case. But McCullough is saying, no, necessary and proper clause, Article 1, Section 8. Article 1, Section 8, and I urge you all to read it. If you don't read any other part of the Constitution, read that. And Article 6, Paragraph 2. Article 1, Section 8 is the Necessary and Proper Clause. I think it's like Paragraph 13. And it says that, Article 1, Section 8 says that the federal government can uh, set measures and balances, and it can set the economy, and it can like issue, um, uh, it can loan money. It can do all sorts of stuff within the economy. And then the Necessary and Proper Clause says, the federal government can do all that is necessary and proper to carry into action the foregoing powers. And that's Article 1, Section 8. So, Article 1, Section 8 gives the federal government the power to make laws that influence the economy, which is a broad interpretation. Strong note, strong note here. This, once again, went to John Marshall. John Marshall, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he took one look at this and said, yes, a national bank is constitutional. Congress can have the power to commission a bank and have that bank and have it, like, control the economy. And that's very, very federalist. Very federalist. So here we are in 1819, and that's the big idea on this case. Here we are in 1819, and we're still trying to work out how the states versus the federal government, what powers and responsibilities we ha they have. We're still trying to work that out. And so, again, we're drifting slowly towards the Civil War because every time one of these things comes to the Supreme Court, the federal government wins. And the federal government is accumulating more and more power, and especially those people who are very conservative in their political outlook, they don't like it. This looks like a strong federal government. They don't like it one bit. They want strong states' rights. Uh, Maryland was a southern-leaning state, and they wanted their states' rights. They wanted the Tenth Amendment, and they lost, and they didn't like it. And this sends a signal throughout the South especially. If you have a Supreme Court case where the federal power is challenged, the states will always lose, which, as it turns out, that's quite constitutional. So... With that in mind, I think I have one last slide, and uh, that is your transition to the next uh, presentation. So on this, all I want to say, and I've uh, said it again on a, on a previous slide, uh, the next series of uh, discussions is going to be the America of Jackson. I'll have one that deals with nothing more than antebellum slavery. Uh, that'll be a presentation all by itself. I might put Indian removal on there, but probably not. Antebellum slavery, God knows, takes a long enough time all by itself. But then there will be a uh, presentation that talks about Indian removal, then the Industrial Revolution, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about Manifest Destiny, and that will end with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago in 1848. So uh, Jacksonian America is coming up next. Uh, in your readings, read everything up to the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago in 1848, and you should be, um, you should be ready for the task. So thank you for your time and your patience on this. Uh, I think the other presentation ran nearly two hours. This one was an hour and a half. For those of you guys that are taking this strictly as an online course, uh, please understand that it took as long or longer when you're actually in a face-to-face -face setting. Uh, so I actually cut some things out to put it on, on the online portion. But um, continue on with your patience, and thank you very much, and I will see you in the next presentation.